Hello everybody and welcome back to another book sharing live stream. So if you're new to this, you haven't joined one of these before, what I do in these live streams is share a photo book that I have that I really like and that I feel would be uh, worth giving you a taste of if you've never seen that photo book before and even better yet if you're not familiar with the artist's work. And in today's live stream, I'm sharing a book called um, A Photographer Found, Vivian Meyer. So this one over here and what you should be seeing now is a bit of a, <clears throat> excuse me, a slideshow of just, uh, you know, the book itself and some documentaries that I highly recommend watching if you haven't seen uh, both of them before. And I'll talk a little bit more about them later. And uh, also, if you are watching this post live stream, these things can go pretty long. And especially with someone like Vivian Meyer, there's a lot to talk about with both her life and backstory and her photography, which uh, this book contains a fair deal of really good um, examples of her photography. So if you are watching that post live stream, feel free to skip ahead a few minutes while I wait for this live stream to populate and just to get the ball rolling or, you know, put the speed up to one and a half or two, whatever you want to do. So do what you need to do and uh, bear with me and the um, sort of slower pace of these live streams. And, uh, and I'd love to open up discussion from you guys at any point throughout this live stream, because I find Vivian Meyer to be someone based on what information is out there to be an extremely fascinating person, like probably more so than anyone else. Uh, as a photographer, at least, that I'm, uh, you know, aware of and have some, have done some research on someone who is really intriguing, quite enigmatic and uh, super interesting, to say the least. So thanks again for joining, for joining live if you're here. And I'm just uh, going to look into the chat and uh, make sure that that's working. So we've got a few people here. Melissa, GP, Benton Lamb. Hello. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining. Uh, yeah, let me know. First off, you know, are you familiar with Vivian's work? I'd like to get an idea of anyone who's here watching live. How familiar are you with her work? Have you seen the documentaries? Have you only seen her work? Are you kind of fascinated by both sides of that like I am? Uh, I personally find her work to be amazing in its own right and the backstory to be also quite amazing in its own right. So I equally am fascinated by and admire both sides of that you know, Vivian Meyer um, intrigue. So let's uh, switch into the other view. So what I do in these live streams, if you haven't joined one before, I can't remember which one I did last. I think it might've been one of my favorite Alex Webb books, but I have this camera view set up here. And um, this is the book. It's quite a big book, this one, uh, heavy, lots of content. And it's by John Maloof, one of the guys who was actually um, one of the better known people to have discovered her work. And uh, the fascinating thing about Vivian's work is if you're not familiar, she was someone who photographed prolifically from an early age, from a very young age, but especially between the 50s and the 70s, roughly, and even probably beyond that. But her work was never really shared or discovered until after she died in uh, 2009, I believe, or around then, which is quite amazing considering how many photographs she has made. And uh, she was also someone who was a bit of a, a lonely spinster, all right? Just, you know, I know that sounds odd, but that's sort of how she's been referred to as, uh, at least in the accounts of a lot of the people she encountered throughout her life. And what she did basically throughout that majority of that period was worked as a nanny, as a caretaker, as a maid, essentially, for various families throughout, especially America, but uh, namely Chicago and in maybe a bit of time in New York. But she photographed a lot in New York and in Chicago, especially, but also around the world. So it's really hard to know where to start with her because there's so much to her life and her backstory. And the great thing about this book is it does provide a bit of that. But again, if you haven't seen the documentaries, at least one of them, I definitely recommend checking out those documentaries. So that's why the book is called A Photographer Found. She was someone whose work was discovered posthumously 
and became famous you know only in recent years and she has a huge body of amazing work and if you haven't ever seen her stuff and you're into photography and especially street photography and i'm assuming a lot of you guys watching here are into film photography and you probably know that she shot a lot on a rolly flex and medium format film especially black and white you need to check out more of her work and this book is a good starting point so a bit of the backstory behind this book is quite interesting in its own right because at the time that I bought it, I wasn't too familiar with Vivian's stuff. I'd heard of her, of course. I was a bit sort of new to it. I was like, oh yeah, you know, I've seen those photos, the lady with the rolly flex, and she was sort of in the, you know, in the world of film photography. And I was in an op shop, what we call here an op shop, but it's a thrift store for a lot of people around the world. And I saw this book on a shelf just at the back behind the counter. I'm like, oh, Vivian Mai, I've heard of her. I've always wanted to you know, have a, <laughs> a photo book. And I asked the lady behind the counter, you know, hey, how's it, how much is that book? And I opened it up and you can see the price tag here. It was $25, that's 25 Australian dollars. The original price was, it's worth US 80. And you can kind of just make that out there maybe. But I was thinking, damn, that's a bargain for a nice, well-sized photo book like this one. And I just thought, I immediately knew I wanted to buy it, but I thought I'll ask this lady if she'll take $20. I'll chuck an offer over and she said, uh, yeah, let me check with the manager. And she's like, yeah, sure, you can have it for $20. So yeah, I was really lucky. I found this book in a secondhand you know, opportunity shop for $20. And that's why it's a little bit uh, ragged, but it's not too bad. And I'm gonna take off the dust cover just so you can get an idea of what's behind it and also get it out of the way while I'm showing you more of the book. But yeah, it's a really good one. So checking some of the comments, sans clouds, an enigma wrapped in a riddle. Yeah, <laughs> I love that expression. I heard it in Seinfeld. I'm not sure if that's uh, where it became popular from, but it definitely fits as a description of Vivian Meyer. Uh, bought this book a week ago, such timing. Great. Yeah, good one. There is another good documentary about VM from the BBC Panorama called Who Took Nanny's Photos? Okay, so that is the documentary I'm talking about. Just to clarify a little bit on the documentaries as I sort of open up the book. There is a very popular one by John Maloof, the guy who put out this book. And there is another one made by the BBC. That's the one uh, mentioned by Sands in the comments there, in the live comments, which is entitled, Who Took the Nanny's Photos? It was part of a series on the BBC called Imagine and she was in an episode of this series from 2013. And I've put links to the IMDb pages in the description of this live stream and video if you want to check them out. But if you were to watch one, I would probably recommend the BBC one. I feel like it's a little bit better. It's a bit more just sort of objective at the analysis of Vivian and her life and it's sort of more the artistic side of it rather than just the a lot of the flawed character that they sort of... Um, describe her as having and it was also released under another name called the Vivian Maya mystery also under the BBC label of 2013 but I'm pretty sure they are both one in the same documentary both the BBC ones that is for me here in Australia those BBC ones are really hard to find they're available on Amazon uh, Google Play iTunes all that sort of stuff but not in Australia it tells you that your region is not allowed, whatever. You can rent it for $3.99 or buy it for $10 roughly, but it's just almost impossible. You have to use a VPN or something, but long story short, I managed to get into a version uh, of Who Took the Nanny's Photos. Great documentary, but John Maloof's one is also really good. I feel like he had a lot more of her best work to show and the interviews, he sort of got in a bit deeper with some of these uh, people that she encountered throughout her life. So, yeah, I can't really recommend those documentaries enough because if I was to go on about her backstory, I wouldn't be able to do it any justice, uh, anywhere near as much as both those documentaries and the content in the forward of this book, which is really good, um, written by, I think I've forgotten now, but it's on the cover of the dust cover. But yeah, the, the book opens up, sorry about that squeaking chair, guys, um, going into the backstory of her, some of her, uh, you know, possessions and her travels. She traveled around the world during a period around the 50s or 60s. And without going too much into it, which is really hard, she was basically a hoarder as well. 
and all of her film was later discovered uh, at auction and in storage units. So John Maloof happened upon her work. He's a real estate guy. He bought some a box of her work in an auction for whatever reason. He was trying to find old photos of Chicago and he sort of looked at the photos, supposedly scanned some, and he saw something in the work and he tried to find more of it. What is also speculated is that he found out through someone else, through a museum, that this is really important stuff. It's worth a lot of money. So therefore, he tried to go and buy more of it, buy all of it out, and he found storage lockers worth. So when she died, she left behind storage lockers full of her possessions, including negatives, prints, slides, undeveloped rolls of film, hundreds if not thousands of rolls of undeveloped rolls of film. It's said that she's taken upwards of 150,000 photos throughout her life. And it was all just discovered later on. So I'm sorry for a lot of you guys watching this who already are familiar with this story, but I'm mainly just saying this for the benefit of anyone who's completely new to Vivian Meyer and uh, just to give this a bit more context. So anyway, that gives you an idea. And as an example, this is one of my favorite things here in this book. It's a contact sheet. She was someone who was an amazing photographer. By the time she started shooting prolifically around the 50s, especially with the Rolly Flex, uh, this is a contact sheet made out of one roll of film, just one roll, okay? So 12 shots on 120, and just look at the, the hit rate. <laughs> For anyone who is a photographer, who is a street photographer, look at the, you know, these are some of her most well-known photographs, by the way. But what's amazing to me is that a few of them are just from one roll of film. In one account, it was said that she would shoot about a roll of film a day, uh, mainly because, well, it's costly and she f eventually struggled to afford the costs of continuing to shoot so much, but also because the Rolly Flex is hard to reload quickly and, you know, she was very accurate and picky with her shots, it seems. Judging by this contact sheet, every single one of these photos is great and they've made enlargements and prints for a lot of the exhibitions that they've done in her name later on. Uh, one of her most famous ones here the shot of the, the woman in front of the New York Public Library, the all the self-portraiture that she's quite well known for, all the street portraits, the, the eye she had for children especially because she was a nanny and she took care of children. I think she was obviously fascinated and, and analytical of the relationship between children and parents, for example. And uh, she also had a sense of humor sort of that you can see in some of the later photographs and, and sense of irony that here, like maybe in... Elliot Erwitt, or uh, she's been likened to Robert Frank, or Helen Levitt, or um, who else? Yeah, so many photographers that she she has little bits and pieces of, and I think she was someone who definitely admired art and photography, and uh, used to go and go alone to a, a film theater, which a guy who is the manager of a film theater in Chicago talks about in that BBC documentary. That's why I really recommend seeing that one. But anyway. Let's look at some, some more of the, the book here. Again, examples of some of her belongings that were later purchased and found at the storage units. Uh, but I would assume that most of what is shown here is part of what John Maloof now owns, which is said to be the lion's share of her work and her belongings and, and all this paraphernalia. And she used to collect newspapers and keep all of these things like receipts and letters and uh, yeah let's look at some photos so anyway let me know what you guys think do you are you guys fans as much as I am of uh, both of the backstory of Vivian Maya and her work and if you're not I hope that uh, through this live stream and this video you get an idea and maybe get inclined to check more of her stuff out because it's it's definitely quite significant in the world of street documentary photography, even portraiture, uh, you know, social landscape of America, and even a little bit of worldwide photography that she did later on as well. And you can immediately see here uh, that the identifying look of her work is generally that sort of square black and white look taken on medium format and the Rolly Flex, a lot of, uh, you know, tri-X pan and plus X pan sort of film throughout the 50s and 60s especially. And again, I'll do what I usually do in these live streams. I'll try not to give away too much of the book, but just to give you a really 
nice idea of the kind of work that she's known for. And I see elements of all kinds of photographers when I look at her work, and that's the interesting thing about it. So even here, uh, I think this is why some people would sort of call her someone who was like Robert Frank, for example, in that sort of anal analysis of the American social landscape and being able to capture so much life in such simple little compositions like this one. If you look at how much is going on in this scene, she was someone who I would definitely say was a very observant person who, especially if you have a hit rate that big and you're shooting one roll a day, maybe she did, maybe she didn't, maybe someday she shot one roll, but even then she would have to have been someone, someone with a, an amazing eye for, for people and an interest in people and a fascination with the world to really uh, be this analytical and observant enough and then be so precise as to capture these moments exactly at the, the right timing or in the right frame or something like that. So, yeah. She carried a camera everywhere and during her nannying jobs, she would often take the children she was uh, caring for out on day trips to the city or wherever. A lot of it was in the suburbs uh, of either New York or Chicago or she used to enjoy going into the cities and you see another thing that characterizes her work is a lot of self portraits but i think it's just that she took a lot of photos and that there are quite a few self portraits amongst them but she was quite masterful at using the rolly flex um, for sure and she does have a, fair, a bit of color work amongst it but i feel like the black and white uh, definitely outweighs the amount of color work she's done. Sands, as per the Maloof doc, her photos were acquired by a few different people via auction in her unclaimed storage locker. Maloof bought much of this back. Yeah, yep. So there was a Mr. Goldstein. There was actually quite a few people who bid on amounts of her work at auction for pretty low amounts, like $200, $300, 380 whatever it might have been, and it's worth so much more now. And some of the auction houses that even they made a fair bit of money selling it to these characters, they still lost out on um, what ended up being something that was extremely valuable now. Vincent, her hit rate is big. Hey, man, thanks for joining. Uh, yeah, definitely, hit rate. And she, she just shot a lot. She was a prolific photographer. Katie62. Just a shame that such an amazing photographer never ever got to the fame and recognition she deserved while she was alive. She is right up there with the Bressons, Dorothy Langs, Diane Arbus, etc. Yeah, yeah. so was, there was someone, I think it was Joel Mayerowitz in both of the documentaries talking about her, but his presence in the BBC documentary is a bit better. I feel like they, they really allowed him to sort of voice his opinion more. And, um, and Mary, Mary Ellen Mark, I think, even looked at her work in one of the, the two documentaries. And she definitely likened it to sort of your Robert Frank, Diane Arbus and Helen Levitt uh, type of street photographers before even street photography was a big thing. One of her quite well-known self-portraits there. There's an ongoing exhibition now in Tokyo for people here. Well, that, that's cool. So if anyone's in Tokyo, or in Japan in general, it's a pretty easy trip up to Tokyo. Uh, definitely go check that out. That would be cool. If I was there, I would definitely be checking that out. So thanks for that tip, JP. And yeah, what um, Katie's saying about the sort of the shame of her never being recognized, and it's a little bit of a sad story once you actually sort of dive into it. And there's a lot of ethical questions that come up as to what, you know, should have been done, what could have been done, and uh, what would she have thought, what would she have wanted. The general consensus is that, well, it's almost painfully obvious, is that she was a very private person. She wasn't very social by traditional means. She was very interested in people, and she did actually get along with a lot of selective uh, people she encountered in her life, but she wasn't someone who was generally a sociable person who collaborated very openly. She was very selective, private, reclusive, and probably uh, troubled in some way or another. You know, everyone is in some sense, but she was sort of a, saw herself perhaps as a displaced character, not fitting in within society or searching for how she fits within society. That's why I really like the title of this, A Photographer Found. It's almost like she's sort of trying to find herself um, or her place within society. 
So the exhibition in Tokyo is at the Akio Nagasawa Gallery in Aoyama from JPB there. So definitely anyone in Tokyo, and that's pretty cool. The last thing I saw in Tokyo was actually an exhibition of Ansel Adams' work at the, the Fuji Film uh, Gallery, which was, um, I can't remember where now, maybe Ginza, but there's definitely some great exhibitions that go on there. So I would highly recommend that. But yeah, just flipping through more of a work. Uh, there's that shot from that contact sheet earlier at the in front of the New York Public Library. And the book sort of starts off with a lot of her work from New York. And it's pretty well laid out. Like, I'm not sure about the whole orange thing. Uh, it's not bad, but I don't know why they went with the orange thing. I don't know if you guys have an opinion on that. <clears throat> I would sort of prefer if it was just a white or a black, but I think it's just to give the, the book a motif and some sense of character, which is fine, but unusual. And yeah, I mean, this is a great <laughs> sort of eye for, for contrast. She was really someone who I think thought a lot about light and dark and, and, and uh, you know, juxtapositions as well. Let's sort of skip through a bit of this. And interestingly, there are some photos of her that she must have had, you know, some of her friends or acquaintances take like this one here. And uh, there's even some interesting stuff from Paris. She made trips back to France. So if you watch those documentaries, you'll sort of find out that she was someone who, although she was born in New York and, and lived in America for the majority of her life, she had a French background. Her parents were from France. A lot of people actually thought she was French because she carried this bit of an accent, which you'll hear in some of the audio recordings and this, the eight millimeter video she shot and whatnot. Uh, this little bit of a French accent, which was sort of unusual. People thought she was French, but she wasn't. She only sort of went back and lived there for some years in her, during her life in a small village. And the story behind that village is fascinating in its own right. So again, really worth checking out those documentaries, guys. Um, I put the IMDB links in the description. And the reason for that, it's really hard to find a direct way. And depending on your region, like I said, it can be hard to actually unlock access to those documentaries. I had trouble. Sometimes you can, you can do the VPN trick or if you're in America, you probably don't have to worry. You can access them through uh, YouTube or Amazon or iTunes or Google Play. Um, even Microsoft videos offered it, but I, I couldn't get it through that. So yeah, try, try your best, but definitely check those documentaries out. Also, let me know, guys, if there's any great photo books you've happened upon recently. If you're sort of a regular with these book sharing live streams, I always uh, look forward to finding out about new work and artists that I never discovered before through the recommendations of a lot of viewers. Uh, I love this whole experience of sharing artwork and uh, getting it out there, finding out more, learning, and even just through looking back at the artist or researching uh, for these live streams. I, I learned a lot myself, so please feel free to give me your recommendations. But yeah, really, really great stuff. Very poetic uh, sort of photography that she at least that we can see in this book. And there's so much more of her work. That's the amazing thing. Benton Lamb. I've got a couple of Fan Ho books that I would like to have a look through. Yeah, I've had a look through one of Fan Ho's books. I don't have it myself. It was a really nice one. One of my friends had a copy. It was quite a large uh, sort of vertical one. And it was amazing. And I believe it's, it's a bit rare now, or maybe it's just a bit expensive. But I would love to get my hands on some of his work as well. And she seemed to, throughout a lot of her work, have a focus on a lot of the sort of downtrodden part of society or some of the, um, the negative aspects of society. She seemed to be fascinated by that, or at least analytical of that within culture things like that. Check out Arthur Tress. Okay. Never heard of him. So that's yeah, brand new recommendation. Thanks for that. See another photo from that same contact sheet on this page here. So that's just from one roll. <clears throat> She's out shooting rain, hail or shine. I love that. 
uh, again, the, the selfies always done so creatively. <laughs> you know, you can just sort of make out her figure there and also the silhouette in the shadow. Um, with the newspapers, I mentioned the, the, there's a lot of account uh, throughout those documentaries, at least, of how she was quite into newspapers and collecting them and headlines and uh, celebrity and political society and, and things like that. And she used to sort of both photograph newspapers or interactions with newspapers like this and collect them, supposedly for the purpose of clipping out portions and articles of newspapers that she liked to later save for whatever reason. And the really sad thing is that by the time she reached her older age, she could no longer afford all the storage fees on all the storage um, lockers she had used to, to keep her stuff and never got the chance to really do anything with it. Whether she would have or not, we don't know that. Uh, whether she would have had a... She was almost someone who didn't have enough time, really, had been shooting all this work. And there was some indication that she did want to do something with some of it. She did want to print some of it. She only ever printed smaller contact prints, for example, but the majority of it just sat in the form of negatives or undeveloped rolls. But there is a really nice scene in... Um, I think it's in the Maloof documentary where he finds the the lab or printer that she wants to use in France, and she she only trusted that one that one gentleman with her negatives to be printed. And there was this really nice letter that they show in the documentary, and uh, it just sort of goes into a little bit of a communication she had with this printer, telling him how she's now gotten into photography with her brand new Rolly Flex and has been taking hundreds or thousands of of photos that she believes are quite good and she, she was aware of her talent and her ability and she actually wanted him to print some of it because he'd only ever done sort of sort of postcard prints for her from photos she'd taken of like the beautiful landscapes in france and whatnot but he only saw this letter when it was presented to him after her death much later in this documentary and it's a bit of an emotional moment when uh when you see that or at least for him uh, and for myself too, that uh, he, she sort of had the intention to actually get some of this work printed. It's, it's almost like she was continuously saving it, waiting for the right time, which just never came. And uh, and now we get to see it. Okay. Another little example of color work. I'll sort of just speed through another chunk of it here. Just as not to give too much of the work. There was, you know, photos from Canada, even Vancouver. She took a bit of a world tour, a bit of a trip around parts of Asia, Egypt, South America. Uh, and some of the photographs in this book have just the caption of location and date unknown. She seemed to have labeled a lot of her stuff, but then some of it not. And they couldn't figure out when and where it was taken. So the mystery definitely plays into her photography but what i find is that even if you were completely unaware of her story and that mystery her work stands for itself in its own right she seemed to be someone who was you know almost hyper intelligent in some manner and uh in touch both in touch and out of touch with with society and was constantly struggling to to find meaning perhaps i don't know um, and that's why my point of view is even though she obviously was very private and she might have been very against the sort of fame she's reached now in the way that it's been attained, I'm glad that people like John Maloof actually discovered her work and put it out there. And I know there's a bit of an ethical sort of discussion that you can open up there as to, you know, is he deserving, for example, of the the credit, the fame, the money, whatever comes with it. Should he have exposed her work in the way he did? Uh, you know, what would she have wanted? What would she have done? How would she have edited her work? And that's a really important question because she might have omitted a lot of the work that is in here that we're seeing, but she was never afforded the opportunity. And the way I see it is that if it wasn't for what happened, perhaps a lot of the stuff would have just been destroyed, undiscovered, gone to waste but this way the world gets to see it so that's what my standpoint is i'm sort of 
you know, I can see both sides of the argument, but I'm quite glad that, you know, her work was eventually discovered and put out despite how reclusive she was about it. So feel free to share your opinion on that. Like, I'd love to see if anyone um, thinks differently. I love this shot. This is a good one. Yeah, again, the children, I think this girl here was one of the persons in the documentary who has, uh, during the time she's grown up and she's giving an account of her childhood experience between the ages of about six and 12 or something. Um, and it's quite fascinating because both her and many other of the interviews and the accounts through the interviews state that Vivian Meyer was someone who was very uh, sort of mean and hard to deal with, which is quite interesting. And almost there's accounts of her being somewhat abusive, but you know, it's, it could be hearsay, I don't know. Uh, but there's definitely accounts of someone, of many people she encountered throughout her life who he remembered her and knew her, gave the interviews saying that she was a very difficult person to deal with, very, you know, ag aggressive almost in her way of speaking or a bit mean and she would sort of snap and had a bit of a short temper, short fuse or whatever you want to call it. But at the same time had that side of her that was very sociable and friendly, but she was just sort of, uh, you know, somewhat dogmatic about her point of view, points of view, supposedly. Given the way she was characterized in the docs, I don't think she would have wanted any of her work to be seen, especially on this level. Yeah, you could definitely argue that. And that's what's so paradoxical about her stuff. That's the, the, the thing about it. It's just, I think, so fascinating to people is that a lot of them fall in love with the story and the mystery and the, the philosophy behind this whole thing more than the work itself. But again, I find that they both sort of stand in their own right. Anyway... Getting towards the end here, so I'm just going to flip through a bit more. And uh, just here you can see she did actually not only shoot the Rolly Flex, but especially later on, it seems, in the 70s. And uh, as she sort of got a bit older, she, I think, seemed to have moved away from the, the Rolly Flex and shot more 35mm with what looks like a small rangefinder, maybe a, an old Leica pre-M body, I'm not sure. Uh, she used to use old items and wear vintage clothes, supposedly even during the time being sort of an anachronistic sort of type of fashion or, you know, interest that she had. Uh, but either way, you can sort of see here that there is a nice variety of work in this book. There's color slide film, I guess, maybe, I don't know, or color negative. Uh, and the square format, medium format stuff. And it's quite varied. I, I like this book because it gives you a bit of that taste of that whole... Uh, range of her work but there is i believe another book that focuses on her color work and um i would be keen to check that out one day but i i truly like her black and white work i think more than her color work not that the color works bad i just i prefer her black and white work vincent interesting you mentioned her personality how do you think that perspective on today's photographer come into play Speaking on how people are and how that affects how we embrace their work. So how do I think that perspective on today's story comes to play? Yeah, well, I think it's completely relatable. That's, for me at least, like, I don't know if it's just, it's obviously not just photographers, but there seem to be some sort of search for meaning or identification throughout not only her work, but a lot of photographers. And... I think people who really relate to her work and have a sense of empathy, which is very easy to do with, with a character like hers, is that she had so much character and the flaws and talent and, and human aspects to her. And it's very easy, at least for myself, to, to relate to her in so many ways of both being a bit of a private person. I mean, I'm probably, I'm not as private as her, obviously, but maybe at some points in my life, I was somewhat private, a lot more than maybe I am now, for example. So I can relate to that sense of uh, feeling reclusive and maybe drawing back to something like high school, being called the weird kid or antisocial or whatever it might have been. There's always something that perhaps you guys watching or myself can find 
uh, relatable about the story of Vivian Maya. And that's why she is so interesting and fascinating because she has so much, you know, human aspects to her. She wasn't just a photographer. She had uh, seemed to have a lot more to her and she had a huge life. She was, uh, you know, so much human with not enough time is the way I sort of see it. And um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the question, Vince, but at least for me, I think it definitely affects how I sort of see her work. Whatever they said about, sorry, whatever they said about Luf has to get the credit for what he did to give the world discovering an iconic work. What matter she to do with it? Her work is dead and now it's unfair. Yeah. So again, there's there's really two sides of that um that argument, whether her work should have been exposed like this and put out to the world for the benefit, perhaps financially or otherwise, of people who had nothing to do with her. Or if it was worth sharing this great artwork, because artwork is a gift. And you know, you sort of when she took all these photographs, surely she had to expect that if you're putting out all this stuff, creating it and saving it in lockers, that there is a chance someone's going to find it, that that is what would happen. And she had encounters throughout her life where, you know, she would be resistant to certain things that would happen anyway, because I think she was smart enough to know that there, I don't know, who really knows? It's hard to say, but yeah. So Anise is saying, I'm with Maloof, whatever was said about that subject. Me too. I am glad I am on his side, even if some people see him as not, you know, rightfully uh, deserving. It's besides the fact, to be honest. And you know, even in the documentary, he sort of says, yeah, I feel a little bit guilty. But then that's just the chance nature of this. He found it. He chose to do something with it. And uh, if he didn't, maybe we wouldn't know about her. So, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm glad. Uh, anyway, more color stuff. Oh, hey Lang, for so many artists, one has to wonder about the impact of their personality on their art and vice versa. For sure. But the funny thing is you don't see as much story and backstory and personality with a lot of other well-known photographers as with someone like Vivian Meyer. Like someone like Henri Cartier-Bresson, I've read a lot of his backstory and he had quite an interesting upbringing in Europe and in the war and whatnot and with Magnum that there's a lot more of a business and technical sense to it. And it's a lot more of the, the artistic sense, but not as much of that sort of humanity that's exhibited throughout Vivian Meyer's backstory, at least through what we've been shown and told. Uh, and, you know, she's not considered as, as much as a, you know, a master photographer as, as him, as HCB, but she carries just as, I don't know, as big of a status in, in my eyes. Uh, Lang, most of my famous friends are introverted and focused on their work and then finding fame. Yeah, I don't think she ever wanted fame at all. I think she would have shown her work to a selective group of people and she seemed to have been a very, very selective person about her interactions and the way she wanted things. She was very particular, even though she was a, an obvious hoarder. It's quite fascinating. Again, that's why I think of it as a very paradoxical uh, personality. Sans Cloud. William Eggleston for one. So that's in relation to uh, one has to wonder about the impact of the personality. Yeah, yeah, William Eggleston, definitely. And I've done a, a book uh, sharing live stream about his portraits book, but I didn't really delve into his personality because it doesn't seem to be as much of an attachment to that, to his work. Whereas it's hard to separate Vivian Meyer's work from her story once you've discovered both sides. I have seen a documentary on William Eggleston, but yeah, I didn't seem to be inclined to really talk about his story in that one. Um, but he is quite an interesting character in his own right. And in this photo, I, I really like this one of all her color photos. She definitely seems to have had this sense of humor that you kind of might've seen throughout, uh, a lot of her work, just even sort of here. And, you know, she was almost someone who you wonder what she thought when she took this, like maybe my guess is that she's looking at this and you go, look at what this guy's wearing. Let's take a photo or I don't know. And, um, she seems to definitely open up questions, even if she had her own point of view on a lot of these situations. And you've got here these three characters all wearing yellow, maybe tourists to Chicago, 1975. Um, this guy with the yellow shorts and socks, this Chevy Chase looking character here. And it's just, I don't know, it's great. And there's even a nice little yellow hat in the background. And um, yeah, maybe she was just sort of as fascinated by I am, as I am by what these guys are wearing. And that's 
simple enough to have taken the snapshot. But yeah, let's sort of um, end it here somewhere. Actually, yeah, on this photo, this is a good one uh, because it's one of the last ones chronologically uh, that you see, especially with the self-portrait. And there you can see her using the 35 mil system instead. So, anything in the back page? Yeah, just another, another cool selfie. Anyway, I know that I tend to go on for quite a while in these live streams, so I will try not to go on for <laughs> too long in this one. Um, sorry about my hairy leg over there, guys. I'm just going to change back to this view. Yeah. Before we end things, feel free to let me know your thoughts and if there's anything you want to contribute to the conversation uh, and you maybe if you're watching this post stream, leave it in the comments. I'm happy to check back on this video and, uh, and open up that discussion into what I feel is one of the most fascinating characters in the world of photography, for sure. And if you weren't here and you just joined recently, definitely check out these documentaries. So you're seeing right now the, uh, the Vivian Meyer mystery, the BBC documentary, which is also called Who Took the Nanny's Photos as an episode of the BBC series called Imagine. Quite hard to find. I couldn't get it on the BBC website. It said it's not available. And check out the John Maloof documentary, which is uh, Finding Vivian Meyer. Vincent, honestly, I'm always interested in how people's personalities are connected to their work. Well, yeah, man. Have you have you actually seen those two documentaries? Because that will really get you thinking deeply about that aspect of it and almost in a self-analytical way about how what I photograph says about me, for example, and what it will as the years go on. Uh, so it can be quite a self-reflective exercise finding out about someone like Vivian Meyer who was a huge character. Big Head Taco. Hey, man. Documentaries were great. Good analysis. Thanks. And if anyone has any other uh, recommendations, I know that there's been other, I think maybe books about her or maybe other documentaries that are even lesser known. So let me know. I know that there's something that came up when I searched. I think it was a, a biography, maybe. Uh, but what I fear is that a lot of this stuff is being put out mainly for, for profit maybe to cash in on some of that fame that is now you know she's sort of become internet famous because she was discovered during the internet age how much of the information we're given is genuine that's that's sort of a question that i uh you know want to know i mean it seems that the majority of it is and um there's so much physical evidence at least in all the letters audio tapes she shot movie film, so many photographs, which when you look at, they actually give you an insight into her daily life. So I feel like the majority of the information out there is completely genuine. I mean, there's not too much reason to twist it too far, but it is a, a valid question still. So Spirit World looks like a great book. Thanks for the share. Thanks for watching. She was definitely an interesting individual, but troubled. I agree. Yep. For sure. Um, I mean, there's even, like, it's quite sad, but a lot of the accounts from both the children she took care of and other people say that she probably had mental illness of some kind. I don't know how we could ever know that and uh, what qualifies that in the first place. Um, yeah. But a total beast with the lens. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, she's one of those people that I think definitely contributed to the rise in popularity of the Rolly Flex, at least, and TLR cameras in general. Not to say that they wouldn't be great cameras and um, pretty popular without her, but I think she definitely contributed in some significant way. Uh, another really sad part is, I think, at the end of the John Maloof documentary where they sort of talked about her final years when she could no longer afford rent, she couldn't afford um, to pay for a lot of the film she left behind at some of the camera stores and, for example, the storage fees, which I mentioned. 
Uh, she became almost homeless, I think. I'm not qu quite sure, but in one of the documentaries, they talk about how she lived out her final years sort of as a vagrant, sitting on a park bench most days, um, shouting at kids or doing whatever she did, <laughs> no longer taking photos. Uh, yeah, until she just fell over one day on a train track and she reluctantly was taken to a hospital. And what's, it's crazy is that she, this was after John Maloof had actually bought some of her work. He looked her up, found not a single thing about her, but it was only after her death that he found a Google search result from an obituary shortly after she died. And, uh, the, and a bunch of events happened after that, which led to him discovering more of her work, whatever that might've been. So yeah. Lang, very sharp cameras and sold mine. But the Pentax 6.7 back in my hands. Yeah, man, I saw your video, the one that you shot the Pentax in that, that car garage. That was awesome. And I know that you've had a couple of 6.7s at least and you had the same experience as me where you bought one that had an issue or something just happening with a lot of eBay sellers right now. They'll list a camera as mint or excellent and you get it and there's fungus and all sorts of problems with it. Um, Suzanne Lopez, I should watch it again. Yeah. Definitely. And it's one of those documentaries that you can watch again and again. And, and the, the longer time passes, you kind of, you find more interest going back to it. Uh, yeah, guys, that's um, most of what I wanted to sort of share and say about Vivian Meyer and on the, the book on A Photographer Found. Uh, in terms of the channel, thanks again for all the support for joining on these streams and watching the videos and, and the comments and sort of becoming part of this really strong community that I feel exists within the film photography world and uh, amongst people on, on YouTube and Instagram, whatever it might be. Uh, being here in Melbourne, you might know that we are still under lockdown due to the pandemic and that we've had a severe lockdown and restricted to only five kilometers travel for only essential reasons for up to two hours a day having and mandatory masks, everything's sort of, you know, quite strict here, but today they are going to make an announcement. Actually, it might've already happened while I was doing this as to we can take a significant step out of lockdown, which I am really looking forward to because as it stands, I haven't been able to go out and take photos for fun or for shoots or for videos uh, for months now, for many months. And there's so many videos I've been itching to go out and shoot and make and to go on hikes and camps again and do all this sort of stuff that can contribute to more content for the channel. So hopefully after today, I'll be able to get out and uh, and put out some more content or at least some more varied content that isn't just restricted stuff I can do here in my room. So yeah, good luck for us all here in Melbourne that they make an announcement today that gives us a little bit more freedom at least. I mean, even if there is a step out of this current lockdown, there'll still be maximums on gatherings and on home visitors and stuff like that. Uh, one thing I really wanna do is go out and do more night shooting. We had a curfew up till a few weeks ago, and even though they removed the curfew, you still can't really go out and just randomly take photos at night for no reason. Uh, even if it's for work, photography isn't an allowed essential work, so I can't do photography work. But I want to shoot a night video on um, some Kodak Vision 500T and 200T that I got from that place that I mentioned in a previous video that does ECN2 developing. So look forward to a video on night shooting ECN2 stuff. I want to do a video on uh, another camera review. I've got another sort of um, topical discussion video on sort of the aspect of making money through film photography and the reality of that situation. So that'll probably be sooner than later. And... Uh, Although I'd been posting videos weekly for the majority of the time over these last few months, I know I didn't put one out this weekend. Uh, I've been sort of burnt out and had a bit of a, a back pain situation throughout the majority of the week. So I only uh, decided to just do this live stream, but hopefully next week I'll put out another video. So uh, just checking comments, thanks for sharing. Thank you for watching. Managed to watch the half stream halfway. Will you put this up so I can watch the full stream later? Yeah, I'm going to leave this one up. I've been doing that with all the streams at the moment. Vincent Perry, keep us posted. Will do, man. Um, definitely looking forward to uh, being able to do more. Safety first, though. I know it sucks, but here in the States, it's like no one cares. Yeah, absolutely. I think they've built the right mindset here and that um, even getting out of this, people will still be pretty sensible as far as um, you know that situation is concerned. 
Benton, definitely safe and sorry. Yeah, agreed. And I think um, the whole world has learned a lot through this situation. Hope it goes well. Um, I had some luck pushing HP 5 3 to three stops for night shots. Nice. Yeah, that's always a good look. So, yeah, thanks for watching the live stream and thanks for watching this if you've watched it uh, post stream. But especially you guys joining, uh, giving the the live comments and one. Oh, hey, Cooper. Cheers with Coops. All come out of COVID shredded like you. Yeah. So he's commenting on the fact that I've been um, getting more into health and fitness and working out during this whole thing, which has been a great plus side, man. Like it's, it's great. Yeah. That is going to be a part of it. Anyway, thanks again for joining. Um, let's, let's chat later, Coops. And um, I'll see you guys in the next video. I'm going to end the stream there. Bye.